I'm now at a pretty good stage of the refurbishment. So I've got all the parts here that I need to put through the sandblaster ready for painting. The hub carriers are ready for vapour blasting now that the bearings are out. And all of these parts are ready for painting once I've done all of the rest of these. The sandblast cabinet here is good for cleaning up all of these little parts. So compressed air comes in here and fires an aluminium grit at each part and blasts off any rust or contamination without being too um, damaging to the individual parts. So you can see I've got part of the handbrake uh, mechanism in here. Within a few minutes it's possible to transform the dirty old looking part into a nice clean part where you can actually see the original casting numbers and uh, everything's all nicely ready for priming and paint. So I'm here at Classic Engine Workshop in Worcestershire and on the bench here are my two hub carriers. So they're just about to go in the vapour blaster which is that one there isn't it? Here's a good before and after. So the one on the left hasn't been through the vapour blaster and the one on the right here looks absolutely immaculate and clean and as though it had just been cast. So you can see the pattern marks very clearly, the part numbers that are cast in it looks like something that's worthy of putting back on a top class restoration. I probably should have taken the bearing shells out here for the fulcrum shaft before it was vapour blasted, but it's a fairly easy thing to do. So you can see there are slots cut in here either side for drifting out the bearing. So I'm going to use this pin punch here and drift out the one on the other side from here. You just need to have it at the right angle to engage with the back of the shell and push it out. So I've just drifted out the last of the fulcrum shaft bearing shells and I'm not sure whether it caused it or it was there already, but I don't remember seeing it. But uh, I've got a nasty looking crack there, so that one really is a structural failure. Getting this crack repaired through welding and machining probably wasn't going to be the most robust fix. All I've had to do is source a pair of hub carriers from another car. Fortunately, near Coventry, not too far away from where I live, there's the Jaguar International Spares Day, which is the largest auto jumble of its kind in the world, I think. And um, loads of different people come from uh, literally around the world. And um, I got this pair from a Daimler DS420. Now this one here is of a slightly different design and it didn't actually match this other one. It's much, much closer, as you can see, to the E-Type um, hub carrier that I've got that's got the crack in it. So I've stripped it, vapour blasted it and it's now ready to go back on. But the lesson I've got to learn is uh, never to drift out the bearing shells from here using one side at a time because that's probably what propagated the crack in the first place. So to get around that and for next time, and what's certainly what I did with this, was get a piece of steel bar and ground it down so that it's possible to fit it in in the slots in the hub carrier and get it behind the bearing shell so you can then drift it out in one direction um, through the hole here. So that will actually come in useful in the future. Um, it doesn't look like very much, but it was exactly what I needed and made sure that this one didn't crack uh, when I took the bearing shell out. And I can probably try and resell this because I'm not going to need it. Although I'll probably keep the, the spined hub and um, various bits and pieces for, for spares. So it was £60 for the pair of those, which is uh, really good value. My next task in getting uh, this IRS refurbished is repainting all of these components. So some of the brake parts I've already taken to the local electro platers to be, uh, to be plated there. They'll be back in about a week. But the rest of this needs to be either painted or powder coated. And I've chosen to do the painting uh, route. So I'm going to be using this American product, which is called POR15, paint over rust 15. And uh, it's a three stage process. So you degrease, you then prime and acid etch all in one, and then you either spray or hand paint uh, with uh, this powerful stuff. Now you need to use gloves with this because if you get it on your hands, you won't get it off for days. Um, and um, it provides a very hard wearing finish. And because some of these, these suspension components obviously are subject to an amount of twisting, um, I think it's better to go for this because it actually really quite um, heavily bonds onto the surface and can actually withstand that kind of um, abuse as well as direct impact from uh, road debris, stones and, and, and the like. I'm going to start cracking on with this first with the degreasing de process, which is why they're all in this tub. So 
I'm not going to be painting the inside of uh, where the universal joint uh, goes here, but it does give a chance to at least clean it and degrease it at this stage so that uh, it's not going to cause any contamination during the paint process. Right, now to rinse everything off and uh, give it a dry prior to the next stage. Okay, with all of this lot rinsed now, what I'm going to do is just take all of the, uh, the cleaning fluid that's in here, the degreaser, and run it through a uh, paint filter and put it into a, uh, a storage jar because it can be used again. So the next stage of the process is to pickle this lot in the metal prep. Rust remover and pre-primer, it describes itself as being. I've warmed this up slightly as it says that it's uh, better to do so. But you just need to get it all wet and keep it wet for about 10 to 20 minutes. So I'm going to do it in two batches because there's too much to put in here at once. In fact, I'm just going to pour it out and then use the brush to uh, keep it all wet. So these parts have been pickling in here for getting on for 10 minutes now. They've uh, changed colour to a kind of dull, uh, almost gunmetal colour. You can see that the, uh, the acid is kind of eating into the um, surface of the metal, which is really good. Leave it long enough and it will uh, eat through and uh, get rid of rust. But uh, you'll see in a minute when I put them under the heat gun to dry them, they kind of get a really nice etched surface look to them as well. So another few minutes and I'll get these out, rinse them and uh, dry them off with the heat gun. I've got these large parts in pickling now, and all of these parts I've rinsed off ready to dry. So what I've done is modified my workbench to give me a suitable place to hang all of these parts and dry them and then paint them afterwards, so that should make my life a lot easier. So I'm hoping that this bit of uh, re steel rebar here, propped up in this way, will be a good uh, height and position to be able to uh, hook everything onto. So I'm just gonna set that up and then I'll get the dryer out and uh, start drying it. As I dry these out, it shows quite clearly where there's a kind of slightly white etched surface. So I'll the output from having done all of that acid etching. You can see there at the top, there's a lighter acid etching on the surface of the Right, so I've now got to the good bit, where everything's laid out, it's primed, it's dry, and uh, ready to be painted. Now, there's a few things to uh, note from this. So one I've already mentioned, always wear gloves, because this stuff um, really does stick like uh, the proverbial. Um, you need to really clean the lid of these, because when you put it back on, if there's any paint, you basically won't be able to open it again. It sticks that hard. They sell them in these uh, pack of, a pack of six, this size, which uh, for something like this is quite uh, handy because this actually goes a very long way and I won't use all of that doing all of this probably. Yeah, I've bought it in a larger size before and you end up wasting it or getting really frustrated when you can't get the lid off. I just use like a cheap artist brush or uh, a disposable one like this and uh, work my way around. That needs at least two coats uh, in order to cover properly and it's about at least two hours between, uh, between coats. So here's the result after all of the painting. I've actually given it all one coat and about half of it two coats. I actually ran out of time yesterday, so I'll need to come back and do a bit more work on these. But you can see that the finish is really very good once you've had two coats on it. These bottom wishbones have only had one coat, so you can see it just looks a little bit thin. So what it says to do is give it a sands with a 300 grit sandpaper, just to give it a key, I assume, albeit that this 
surface texture here is probably pretty good. I'll give it a light sand anyway. What can happen if you don't do that is the areas where there's just a small bit of exposed steel, you can just get small blisters of rust popping through, which you really don't want. And we've got some 320 grit here. So uh, let's give it a go, just giving a light. So I'm just to tee up the surface a bit, doesn't need that much. The second coat's given it a much higher coverage and a much better gloss level. I'm much happier with the way they look. So I'm going to let it dry off for another day and then uh, look at unboxing the universal joints, bushes and everything else that needs to be fitted to all of this to start the reassembly process. In all I've used about three quarters of that small tin to do all of this and I've still got the subframe to do. Now I was considering getting that powder coated but this has all gone so well that uh, I'll put the subframe itself in the tub and do that on its own. So I think uh, this gives a really good finish and uh, it'll very well protect the subframe probably better long term than powder coating will. Another little set of part that needs some attention are these brake pistons. So on the outside they all look in relatively good and clean condition but what I need to do is get the, the pistons out and see what the, uh, the bores of these pistons actually look like. Now what I'll do is take them into the other part of the workshop and get a bit of compressed air in which will force the piston out here and so I can inspect it a bit more closely. But these are in good condition, I'll be able to get them replated, clean them up, replate them and um, reuse them with new seals. If not, then I'll probably have to replace them. I've tried taking this piston out and it simply won't do it. Um, I block up one end and use an airline to try and force the piston out. But as you, as you can see in there, there's a lot of corrosion. So, so the penetrating fluid in here and soaking in, what I'm doing is uh, putting it in the vise to push the piston back in and try and work it a little bit. If I can get it to the stage where I can actually rotate the piston within the uh, piston carrier, then I'll be uh, doing well. So what I've done here is just stuck a nut over that so I don't damage the uh, the bit that the holds the brake pad in place. I'll compress it in the vise. Ooh, okay. that's been stuck for quite a long time. Okay, so another little thing I'm going to do here is by putting slightly longer bolts in here. I can, yeah, there we go. So I can. The penetrating fluid is now getting to the point where. To start to work it it's now rotating where it was completely stuck fast so the piston's stationary the piston carrier is going round and round there we go oh, filthy old piston all needs good clean up there's the seal so i've got all four apart now so i can uh, give them a good clean and degrease and actually determine what kind of state they're in underneath all the grime so with the piston carrier clean and dry, we can now see that there's corrosion halfway up the bore. These obviously need replacing. It might be possible to salvage them, but there's really no point. There are plenty of much better um, modern alternatives to the same exterior size that were just a bolt-on replacement with better seals and uh, will function more reliably and consistently. So that's what's going to have to happen here. Now it's the turn for the rear subframe to be put through the POR15 painting process. So. Here's the degreaser that I saved from the other day that I'm now going to pull back in, clean all this down and repeat the process. It's actually the first time I've done something this big using the Pour 15 painting uh, process. So uh, when I did one of these before, um, I used um, a single pack zinc phosphate paint um, for the, uh, this frame. And that worked really well actually, and the good thing is of course it's very easy to touch up being single pack paint, you can use it with a brush, that was actually sprayed on and gave a really nice finish and it's still, uh, at least a couple of years later, no sign of any rust coming through or anything like that. But uh, this time I want to give this Pour 15 a go because um, it will match everything else, and as I said before I think it will be more durable long term. I've degreased and rinsed it and now it's back in the acid, so uh, you can probably hear the rain lashing down outside only one way to rinse it but um, yeah got it back in the acid now and uh, just need to keep this wet with the acid solution 
for the next 15, 20 minutes. Now I've got that gum metal kind of look to it again, so it shows that the acid has been doing its etching process really well. So I'll get it out of here, give it a rinse, and get the heat gun to dry it out. So I've now got a nicely primed and etched rear subframe. Just a few areas that I need to be doubly sure of. There's still a little bit of moisture in here that needs drying out. Obviously you need to pay particular attention to the holes as well. Now for the good bit. I've set up my workbench with some paper to stop the paint getting on there because it's a real pain to get off. I'm actually going to turn the frame upside down and paint from the inside and then prop it up using these bits of bar on these blocks of wood so that I can get both inside and outside done at the same time. It's one of these things actually, if you're working on a part like this yourself, sorry, if I sent this off to the powder coaters, it would just come back powder coated. But you don't actually think about what's going on in these little closed sections in here. You know, what's going on behind the scenes? So um, what I will do with this is once all the paint's dried and everything like that, I'll get in with some rust preventative uh, wax and actually spray a little bit in there just to get everything in as much as possible to get everything protected, even in the hidden areas. Another advantage with using a brush is I can really work it into these seams, these joins that are uh, all over the place on here. Powder coat would struggle to really get into. I had a some wheels, steel wheels, powder coated years ago. And where the inner rim met the outer part of the wheel, there were some small blows in the powder coat. And the guy basically said that you couldn't get the powder coat in there. And that's why it bubbled up right on those seams. It was really annoying, but there was nothing they could do about it. So here's the first coat done, looking a lot better already, but it definitely needs another coat. If we look close up, we can kind of see that uh, the gloss level is not as good as the suspension parts. And uh, there's a few bits where there's probably a little bit of steel exposed. So I've let the first coat go off overnight and I've given it a light sand all over. I'm now going to go for the second coat. So that's the second coat. It's looking a lot better, but I think I'll still give it a third coat in some areas as well that are looking a little bit thin still for my liking. So I'm just getting to the finishing stages of the second coat on the outside of the frame, having done a third coat on a few areas on the inside. I have to say it's now really beginning to look any bit as good as a powder coated frame with, I think, better durability properties. This is going to set really nice and hard and be very durable for stone chips as well as for torsional stress through the subframe. Obviously with the wishbones acting through here, the frame will definitely twist. And I think that's where the weakness of this really comes in with a powder coated finish, as that powder coat can be subject to cracking. And if you get moisture behind the powder coat, that's where it's really flawed. So uh, I'll just final few checks on this to make sure I don't have any drips or sags. And I've got really good coverage I might yet do a third coat on this just to really give it a good finish. But uh, I have to say, I think it's looking absolutely fantastic now. Thank you very much for watching. Please join me next time when I'll be looking at the differential, which is the last major component I haven't done anything with yet. And I'll be unpacking all of the boxes with the new springs, dampers, bushes and bearings and combining them with all of the refurbished parts and this rear frame to get it together again, ready to put on the car.